Hi, everyone. Welcome to Protocol Labs Research Seminar Series. Today's speaker is Sarah Azuvi. Sarah is a Protocol Labs Research Scientist. Her interests lie at the intersection of applied cryptography, distributed systems, and game theory. She received her PhD from UCL, where her research focused on decentralized consensus protocols with additional attention to other aspects of decentralized systems, such as governance. Sarah, I will let you take it from here. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. So today um, I'm going to present my paper, Winkle, which is a decentralized uh, checkpointing for proof of stake systems. Um, this is a work that is joint work with uh, Lera Nikolenko and uh, George Danesis, uh, both at uh, Facebook Novi. And uh, this is a paper that um, was presented and is um, appeared in the proceedings of AFT uh, 2020. Uh, by the way, I'm just going to say quickly that um, this is a talk that is shorter than uh, the full hour. So if, we, if you want to ask questions in the middle of the talk, I'm, I'm fine with, with this. So feel free to. Um, OK, so I'm going to start this talk by giving a quick uh, recap on proof of stake. I'm sure everyone um, is familiar with this, but just so we are all on the same page. Um, so proof of stake, as again, I'm sure you all know, um, has been proposed as an alternative to proof of work because it consumes less energy. And the idea of proof of stake is that we will have a set of validators that are usually a subset of the coin holders that are going to run a consensus uh, protocol between them. So we will not have this like proof of work investments of um, hash power, etc. So it's much, uh, much more um, efficient. Um, so um, uh, what there are many different proof of stake protocols that have been proposed. And the one that I'm going to focus on this talk is a BFT like consensus protocol. So you can think um, about it as some kind of like simple scheme when one person will be the proposer for a block and then the other validators are gonna vote for that block. And as soon as enough validators have voted for the block from the proposer, that block is gonna be validated. So we have this like proposed vote uh, type of, um, of this. And um, I'm focusing on this type of proof of stake protocols particularly because it has like one advantage is that there are no forks. So this is in opposition to uh, longest chain protocols right here. We don't move to the next uh, block before, you know, a block has been validated um, by enough, uh, enough stake or enough uh, votes. So for example, um, Hot Stuff was one scheme that was uh, presented uh, based on BFT in the concept of in the context of blockchain. And also Thundermint are using a similar, similar protocol, but there are, there are many others. So one thing to note in um, any proof of stake protocol is that the set of validator is allowed to uh, change in time. So we can start with you know, a set V as you see on my slide here, and then, you know, like these people who acted as validator at that particular point of time, maybe, you know, they want to leave the system. Maybe new people uh, will be able to come and replace them. So we can change from one, one block to another and have another set of validator, for example, V prime. So um, there have been a lot of attacks that have been discussed in proof of stake systems. And one of them that I'm gonna uh, detail now is long range attack. So the idea behind a long range attack is that an adversary is going to corrupt previous validators. So here the, the adversary will go and see um, validator, you know, from the first block that are no longer part of the consensus protocol, but they really have no stake involved in the system. And the adversary will basically be able to buy their coins at no cost because, you know, this um, these keys that they were using at the time of the uh, at the time where, when they were validators, they have no money attached to to it anymore. So basically, they are worthless at that point of time. And the idea is that the adversary is going to use those keys from the previous validators, and is going to be able to rewrite the chain with this. And the idea here is that because we are in a proof of stake setting. It's like uh, costless and timeless to create block. So the adversary can just get the keys and instantaneously 
create a chain that is as long as the honest chain. And even the adversary that has, you know, the keys from the previous validators could, for example, um, simulate a configuration as if the um, set of validators has changed when really like um, this is all the adversary. This attack is very problematic. And the reason why it's problematic is that imagine that we have some user Alice that has been online for a long period of time. And then when she wakes up, she sees these two chains and like they, ha they are the same length. They both look as legitimate um, as the other. So there is no way in this uh, setting for Alice to know which chain is the adversarial chain and which chain is the honest chain. So that's a very serious attack. And this is why in our paper, uh, we present our scheme Winkle that allows to thwart this attack. So the intuition uh, between um, the intuition um, of our scheme Winkle is that in addition of having the set of validator that are gonna validate the block and thus create the blockchain, we will also ask our users, Alice and Bob, who are not validators to sign the block. And the idea is that, um, you know, users will sign in real time the block. And so when the adversary does the long range attack, the chain of the adversary will not have the user signatures. And thus it will be possible for someone who has been offline for a long time to see which chain is the honest chain and which chain is the adversarial chain. So the idea is like whenever um, our users, Alice and Bob, want to, want to send transaction, they're going to include a sender, a receiver, and an amount as before, as your, as your usual transaction. And in addition to this, they're going to include a block. So for example, you can think they're going to include the hash of a block to say, I commit to this block. Um, now let me motivate this, um, this idea. The idea is like um, the proof of stake protocol that I have mentioned at the beginning, they only work well with a relatively small set of validators. They don't scale very well. And even if you think uh, of a proof of work blockchain, for example, if you look at, at Ethereum or um, Bitcoin, you know that you know the set of miners, which will be the equivalent of validators, is quite small. Um, it will be usually less than 100. On the other hand, if you look at the set of users, so people who just you know hold coins and maybe some transaction um, from time to time, it is much much bigger. So the idea is like it is relatively easy for an adversary to bribe previous validators because there are not many of them, but it will be much, much harder for an adversary to get the keys of all the blockchain users because there are really um, a lot of them. So the idea is like by using Winkle, we make the attack, the long range attack, much, um, much more unrealistic, much less realistic. Okay, um, so now let me recap our scheme Winkle. So votes, votes for blocks are included in transactions. Because as I've said at the beginning of the talk, we, we are focused mainly on BFT-like consensus protocol. It means that there are no fork choice rule. So it's not like you know in a proof of work system where maybe um, users will need to choose which chain they, they are gonna mine on. In this case, no, like it is clear which block is the correct one. And so we don't have problems of equivocation. Um, now we add a couple of rules. One rule is that each coin carries a vote. And the second one is that each transaction updates the vote to a newer block. So I'm going to illustrate um, these two rules so that they, they make <laughs> more sense. OK, so let's assume that we are in this state of the database. So we are in block B1. We have account A that uh, have, has two coins and account B that has one coin. coin sorry. By assumption, we assume that all the coin, coins are voting for the Genesis block. Now let's assume in the next step that account A is sending one coin to account C and includes a vote for B1. So what's going to happen in the next uh, state of the database, in the next block, is that we're going to have one coin in account A that is voting for B1 and one coin in account C that is voting for B1 as well. 
So that's why I said previously that each coin carries its votes because the votes that A, that A included in its transaction is carried up to block C. And also similarly, what I say is like a vote updates um, all the coins to that account to a newer vote. So like it means that the coin that is left on block on account A also votes for B1. So that's basically how the how the mechanism of um, of voting propagates. It propagates to the new account and to the uh, sender account, sender and receiver. So again, let's illustrate this one more time. Let's assume now that. Uh, account B is going to send one coin to account A and includes a vote for B2. So now, again, this coin is going to carry its vote, so it's going to vote for B2, and there is no more coin in account B, B, so they are, that's it. And so what we see is like in account A, now we have one vote for B1 and one vote for B2. So in total, that will be two votes for B1 and one for B2. Um, so that's, that's how, how this works. So um, in order to have the protocol working, we need to have some add some constraint. And we ask that um, the users have to vote for the latest epoch. Uh, so we can think of an epoch as, for example, you know, an, a number of consecutive blocks. So it means that um, that's like a, a, a restriction. Users who are online, they need to be aware of, you know, at least the latest latest. Um, states of the database. It could be maybe a day or, or maybe less uh, depending. And additionally, what we're going to have is like when two thirds of the votes, um, when two thirds of the votes are voting for a block, then that block is going to be checkpointing. So for example, in my um, in my scheme here, we would say that block B1 is checkpointing because everyone has voted for block B1. Um, okay, so um, I think that this seems you know relatively easy when you look at this or you just vote for a block that's great you know there is no fork choice rule so no equivocation problem so what could go wrong so what could go wrong is like the adversary could also hold some coins right um obviously in our assumption we're going to bound this uh, let's say for example here the adversary has one out of three coins so Maybe, you know, in the next state of the database, the adversary will send uh, his coin to Alice and Bob will send uh, his coin to the adversary. So we see that in both states of the database, in both blocks, the adversary has one out of three coins, right? So we could think that our assumption is um, respected. However, what could happen is that our adversary that is doing the long range attack is going to be able to, in its adversarial block, uh, in its adversarial chain, to hence pick which transaction it's going to include and which transaction it's not going to include. So, for example, in our case, the adversary will be like, "Oh, that transaction, you know, that Bob sent me, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that. I'm gonna keep that coin. However, when I send one coin to Alice, I'm not gonna include that transaction." So what this means is that in the adversarial chain, the adversary, by hand picking which transaction to include, and especially which transaction not to include, because we're in that case, it's like not including transaction, the adversary is able to um, accumulate more stake. And that's very problematic because, for example, in that case, you can see that in, in the block, in the adversarial block, the adversary looks like it has two thirds of, of the um, of the coin, and so maybe it would be able to uh, checkpoint its own chain. So that's um, that was like one of the difficulty of uh, designing this chain, even though it's, it looks uh, quite easy. So how do we achieve security? So first, we need to to uh, cap the maximum fraction that the adversary can has by um, a fraction f y of the total stake. And now, and that's a more unusual assumption, we also need to cap the maximum amount of stake that can move within an epoch. And then by requiring that Fy plus Fx over two is less than a third, we can ensure that the adversary cannot obtain more than one third of the stake. And we can ensure that the adversary cannot forge a checkpoint. Um, next, in our scheme, we also add a key rotation. 
the idea of adding a key of adding a key rotation is that now the adversary will be um, able to dynamically corrupt no users new users so it means that the adversary is going to be able to be stronger which again is a more realistic assumption so how does this work uh, what we ask is that when a user does a key rotation, for example, here, Alice is going to go from, from her key A1 to her key A2, they have to also include a signature and a block, so a vote, in their key rotation. So really, you can think of key rotation as a transaction. It's like sending money to yourself, basically. And um, this ensured forward, forward security. So the adversary will not be able to corrupt different users in different blocks, and still we will have uh, security. So let me illustrate um, how this works. So let's imagine that in the first block here, the adversary has, corrupt, has corrupted key B1 of Bob, right? And then later on in our you know, latest block here, the adversary has corrupted key A2 of Alice. The idea is, like, is that Alice key rotation includes a commitment to Bob's because Alice key rotation includes a vote for block B1 that contains the key rotation of Bob. So what this means is that if the adversary um, wants to use Alice key, it has to give up Bob key. So the adversary cannot accumulate key even if it's corrupt different users in different um, period of time. Okay, next I'm gonna be talking about minting. So um, as you know, usually in proof of stake or any blockchain, creating blocks come with some mint transaction. So it means that every time a block is created, some money is minted. And you can see that in our setting, having new money created at each block is going to be very problematic. Because it means that, again, in the adversarial chain that the adversary is creating, all the money that is minted can go to the adversary. The adversary can just you know, take all the new minted code. And again, um, if the adversary does that, then we can see that it can accumulate uh, more than two thirds of the money, and um, meaning that it will be able to forge a checkpoint. So um, how, how do we resolve this problem? So what we ask is that the mint transaction need to be checkpointed. So what this means is that um, before the coins are actually minted, we need the block that created those coins to be checkpointed. So for example, in that case, when the adversary does the adversarial chain, chain, sorry, because its block will never be checkpointed, it means that all the money that has been minted will never actually be effectively minted. The coins will never uh, be usable because the blocks haven't been checkpointed. So that's also a requirement to ensure that the adversary cannot gain more uh, than two thirds of the money. This scheme is uh, related to um, stake bleeding attacks that have been uh, proposed before by um, Peter Gazi and his co-author, if you are familiar with this. Okay, uh, next I'm gonna be talking about uh, Winkle's efficiency. So in order to have um, an idea of how efficient Winkle was and, you know, especially how fast it would take to um, checkpoint a block, what we did is that we simulated Winkle on Bitcoin and Ethereum. So now Bitcoin and Ethereum are proof of work. I'm aware of this, not proof of stake, but it doesn't really matter um, in that specific example, because what we are interested in is the user's behavior, because really Winkle rely on the user's behavior. So that's what we wanted to uh, get there. And so that's why we use the two main cryptocurrencies uh, to see, let's imagine, you know, they were proof of stake and Winkle was implemented on top of this. How would um, user behave and how long would it take for blocks to be checkpointed? So we simulated this. What we did is like we took the 
blockchain uh, from Bitcoin and Ethereum, and we assumed that every transaction contained a block, uh, sorry, contained a vote um, uh, for the previous block. And then we saw how long it would take for you know, a block to be checkpointed. Um, so here are the results. It's generally bad news. Um, it is quite long. So in Ethereum, it will take between 50 days and one year to have one block checkpointed. And in Bitcoin, it would take between four months and three years. So obviously that's, um, that's not very good. We, that's not result we are happy with. Uh, if we want to understand a bit more uh, in depth why that is the case. I think everyone here is familiar with like the HODL movement. Uh, we know that in cryptocurrencies, usually people are quite incentivized to um, HODL to their coins, which means not moving them, keep, keeping them idle in an account. And obviously, if we had, you know, let's say a proof of stake system that was used in a more mainstream way, then we wouldn't have uh, this problem. Um, but still, uh, in order to um, to get a bit uh, be better results, uh, what we did is that we also included in Winkle a de delegation scheme. So the idea is that our users, um, Alice and Bob, they are going to be able to delegate their uh, coins to a delegate. So what that means is that Alice and Bob, they are now able to just leave their coin in their account and not move them or hold all to their coins. And whenever their delegate is going to vote, this vote is also going to impact the votes uh, on Alice coin and Bob coins. So basically what it means is that the delegate is voting with the stake of their delegate. So we can see why uh, other than this, Everything, everything is similar. Basically, you can just assume that they are all in the same account. That's that's kind of like how this works. So um, I think there is one quite uh, obvious problem with this, and uh, the most obvious problem is that having delegation it adds more centralization, right? Because more people give their stake to less people. And uh, if you remember at the beginning of my talk, I said that uh, the whole point of having Winkle was that it was harder to compromise, you know, users because there were more of them compared to um, validators. And here we see that if we have fewer users, that kind of like um, counterbalance this. So what we're going to do is that we're going to use economic incentives to ensure uh, that an exact number of pools are uh, obtained. So um, more precisely, what we're going to do is like we're going to cap bound the amount of uh, money that a pool, and when I say pool here, it's like a delegate, uh, that a delegate can get to ensure that enough pools or delegates are created and that we don't end up in a system where we have you know, only like one delegate and then it would be very easy for the adversary to to mount the attack. Uh, so one example also that you can think with delegation is that cold wallets could delegate to hold wallets. So, you know, most people have most of their money in the cold wallet and then uh, they want to, to have this money uh, attached to their hot wallet so that their vo votes count. Um, so in order to, to do this uh, delegation scheme, we used um, a reward scheme that was um, uh, proposed by uh, Lars Bruns and his co-author that is called Reward Sharing Scheme for Stake Pools. And so really like the idea of using this scheme is to have a trade-off between having um, enough pools or enough delegates such that we ensure that it will be too hard for an adversary to compromise them, but also have not too much such that the um, uh, protocol Winkle is efficient, and we don't have to wait for three years to have a, ch uh, a block checkpointed. Okay, so again, what uh, we did is that we simulated delegation on the Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin blockchain. So what we did here is like we look at those blockchain and we took the let's say k most active. Um, account and we assume that the most active account would be the delegate so that they will you know uh, contain the um the rest of the stake in them 
And uh, so without surprise, if we do this, we get much, much better results. For example, in Ethereum, uh, uh, a checkpoint is now, um, a block is now checkpointed in less than four days before it was a year. And in uh, Bitcoin, instead of having three years before, we can also achieve less than four days. So we really see like here that we can have this kind of like trade-off trade uh, by having um, delegates that um, are going to be numerous enough that they are not um, uh, compromised, but also have something that is less than a year and on, only a couple of days. Um, so also something to note here is like the time it takes to uh, checkpoint a block is not necessarily the uh, finality time that we talk about in blockchain. So what it means is like a user will not necessarily um, need to wait for a block to be checkpointed in order to ensure that their um, transaction is um, is validated. But what uh, what this you know this time mean is really the time that validators needs to be uh, honest. So it means that as long as uh, validators are honest for you know as long um, uh, how, how long it takes to checkpoint a block, then the blockchain will not be will not be susceptible to long range attacks and thus. Um, users do not have to worry about them and can just use the underlying finality of the consensus protocol. Okay, so let me um, quickly recap before finishing um, um, what, our, what we achieved in this paper. So um, we propose a checkpointing uh, mechanism that is both on-chain and decentralized. I think they were, there are other uh, checkpointing mechanisms that have been uh, proposed, but usually they will be uh, either somehow centralized or off-chain. And really with this scheme, the advantage is that a user you know, doesn't need to uh, go somewhere else to, to, to check which chain is, is the right one. This is really self-contained within the blockchain, which is again a very desirable uh, pro property of uh, blockchains, which are meant to be trustless. Um, so again, like this, um, this gives security to a certain against a certain type of attack, and this is especially uh, for users that have been offline. They can now safely verify the blockchain when they come back online. So as we saw uh, the difficulty of, um, of designing this, this scheme was that the stake is constantly changing. So if you think about a uh, usual you know, voting scheme, for example, a BFT um, uh, type uh, protocols, usually you have a static st set of, um, of validators. So in that case, we have the opposite of a static state. So that was where the difficulty came from. And also, lastly, what I'm going to say, and also this was the reason why I wanted to, you know, we, I thought it was better to present this paper. Uh, and sorry, by the way, for the last minute change is like, I think that this scheme could also with like a bit of work, but not too much, be extended to either proof of work or proof of X, for example, proof of storage um, in order to improve finality. So um, the idea then, um, if we wanted to apply this scheme to a proof of X um, blockchain would be that um, same as before, user will need to uh, include votes in their transaction. But uh, this time, if we don't have a BFT-like consensus protocol, what we will need to make sure of is that users are voting for a block that is enough in the past to ensure that no equivocation can happen. Um, that's the end. And if you want to ask a question, you can ask a question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think due to some audio disturbances on Jonathan's part, I'll take ah. over the question session. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a wonderful Thank presentation. You. Is there, are there any questions? You mentioned before uh, that like, there's not enough, something like there's not enough transaction uh, funds moving around in, on Ethereum, yeah. and that's why it takes so slow, basically. I think that's uh, likely going to change uh, uh, since like uh, last year or something like that with DeFi, that like uh, where you you were able to lend your money, and then smart contracts are automatically doing exchanges and loan and borrows. Mm -hmm. So there are more and more uh, reason not to hold uh, anymore and make uh, your tokens a bit more profitable than just a link. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, 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 that's great. Um, to be fair, yeah, we did this. So we did this simulation. It was uh, summer 2019, so already quite a long time ago. I think maybe it would oh, yeah. be interesting to, to do them again and see if now. I mean, I don't know how DeFi is. Is it really like already quite <laughs> working now? I mean, right now, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum fees are quite high because mm -hmm. of this. So I think it will change the result quite a lot. It would be interesting to see. Okay, to yeah, see maybe that. maybe I'll take my code and, and rerun it like now and, and see that. That's 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 a good suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Thanks. Okay, one one last question. See if there's no other question. Um, uh, how hard is it to put this into Firecoin? So yeah, as I was thinking, I think we will need to, <laughs> to think more about it. So I think if we wanted to put it into Firecoin, so as I said, it, at the end of the talk, what we would need is like to ask users to vote for finality blocks in the past. So because we don't have such a nice finality in Falcon, like maybe we will run into like um, more challenging um, like um, assumption. I'm just because if you remember, uh, let me just go back to this so I can have this. Yeah, so we have this assumption, right? So. Um, we need to bound the uh, stake that moves within an epoch. So uh, again, so in that in our case, it would be that an epoch will be like kind of like finality. So we will need to make sure that in that epoch, there is not like more than FX stake that moves. And the longer it is, the bigger FX is going to be. So maybe it's going to mean that we are less, we need to decrease the FY on that side. So it means that we need to reduce the fraction of stake from the adversary. So that's why it's a bit more tricky to do it in blockchains where you can have uh, forks because then we, you end up with kind of like maybe too long period. So I think, yeah, I think that's that, that's uh, I, that's something that we wanted to investigate. Um, that I think that could be doable and, but we'll need, yeah, we'll need maybe a, a bit more thinking about all this, how, how this, this would work in our case with our finality basically. But doable. Yeah, because at the same time, the uh, I mean, only if you are acting honestly, uh, but normally your power should degrade or only after 24 hours. I mean, maybe it's a smoother degradation. I don't know. It's like one, maybe. What, what can degrade? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch uh, that. I mean, your, your power degrades uh, after 24 hours. Um, I mean, if you miss a window cost, so maybe it's a bit more, a bit smoother degradation, and and uh, so you can restrict the the amount of stake that moves within less. Ah, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, because especially yeah, with the window post and stuff like this, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I don't. Know yeah, yeah, but it's a another meeting session. Yeah, it would, it would definitely need some adaptation, but I think that that, that could be a starting point yeah, to, to, think, uh, to think about this. And also one thing to note, because I know we've been also like quickly discussing this, is like if we do this, like for example in Filecoin, we will not improve Filecoin finality, like the finality will still be the same. We will just ensure that Filecoin is not um, vulnerable to this type of long range attacks that unfortunately we, we also have in, Proof of stake, and also we would ensure like more like less probabilistic or like more probabilistic than I see it, like a stronger finality. But the length of the finality will will not change. Then just it will be like stronger but not shorter. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. I've there's another question from the chat I'd like to get to. Um, how much does Winkle vary from the Ethereum two solution to this attack? Um, so I think I think Ethereum too. What they are doing is like more a kind of like hybrid proof of stake. So um, what they have is that the validators are like voting, right? So basically, it's like I think ultimately they want to have like the voting as part of the consensus protocol. Whereas what we have is that the users like they are not taking part in any like consensus protocol. They are just like including votes in their transaction. So I think that's kind of like maybe the main difference is like um, in Ethereum, you need to like be uh, like stake some money to be like a validator and maybe like 
have you know do some effort and then if you don't vote you're gonna get slashed or something like that whereas in our case it's just like user so it's maybe kind of like less um for users it's less effort so yeah i would say that ethereum is more a consensus protocol where we are more a layer on top of the consensus protocol okay sarah thank you so much and thank you carla for moderating or uh, loud construction happening on my end. Our next talk is Tuesday, February 16th at 1700 UTC from Joel Chan, who is an assistant professor at the iSchool at the University of Maryland. He will be talking about social computing and collective problem solving, which I'm very excited about. If you're watching on YouTube, please join our mailing list. You can specify the types of emails that you want to receive so you don't have to get emails you don't want to. We use this list to advertise future talks, research funding opportunities, and other important news from Protocol Labs research. You can subscribe in the footer at research.protocol.ai. Remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons and share this video. If you want to suggest a topic or a speaker, there are instructions on how to do that in the description, or you can just email us at research at protocol.ai. Thank you for joining everyone. We will see you next time.